thank you very much. A particular thanks to the BAA for, uh, for allowing me as I return to medieval bridges after a lifetime in the House of Commons. Um, Sorry, for, for, for letting me give this talk. Um, I uh, also, uh, it provided an incentive for me to, uh, to start work again. And, and without that incentive, I may well have spent my time in front of a TV set during the day. For, so for keeping an old man busy, thank you very much. Um, I began my research more decades ago than I, I like to think. I dare to remember. Um, in those days, history, in the history faculty, the main topics of interest, I think, would have been something like the Five Hyde Unit or um, the County Affinity. Bridges, very definitely, were seen as really rather odd. Um, I'm delighted to know now that uh, the infrastructure is very much the flavour of the month. And, um, and as I hope to show, there is a great deal of medieval transport infrastructure that survives. A great deal of many magnificent projects were built. And if this talk has a subtext, it's largely just to show you quite a number of pictures of this magnificent infrastructure. Uh, but of course there is an argument. And my argument is that Old London Bridge has been seen as the archetype of medieval bridges. Um, and this really wasn't a, and, and also that it was seen as not a very good one, however picturesque it was. So to take a popular book, um, Hopkins, writing in 1970, described in a history of bridges, the Roman bridges, which was really rather good, then went on to the medieval bridges, uh, of which he just showed London as the one prime example of a medieval bridge before turning to Florence and then the modern bridges. Um, in a sense, there was a feeling that, uh, that London Bridge was a bit like Dr. Johnson's dog, um, it was remarkable that it walked on its legs, um, but it's a pity he didn't do it very well. Um, even, even distinguished scholars like Ted Ruddock, who looked at bridges after 1835, as the background for those superb 18th and 19th century bridges, picked out London and three other bridges as, uh, as what was wrong with medieval bridges and why the new bridges had to be built. Now, I said in 2004, that this was quite false, that, uh, that if you looked at ordinary medieval bridges, they had little in common with medieval, with uh, London Bridge, and about 150 of them survive, and, and more fragments as well, which shows that they were really quite adequate for the, for the task. But when I returned to bridges, I went, well, was London Bridge typical of the great bridges or the larger bridges? And this is what I want to look at uh, today. Uh, starting with the, the date of construction, so London Bridge is built 1176 to 1209. Some people have tried to argue it was later to, to give more emphasis to the work of Isambert of Saint, who came in in the early 13th century. But the archive, the abutment dendrochronology suggests that a, quite a lot was being done by, uh, by the 1190s. Um, secondly, the foundations, and this is where um, much of the criticism has been, has been made. They were built on starlings, which I'll describe later, later, and there was a tremendous fall through the bridge. It meant huge sums of money had to be spent on maintenance. Uh, in London Bridge had a large income and spent it on this, an income of about 500 a year, spent it on this and, and the bridge estate. Um, shooting, the, uh, shooting the rapids became a, a sport for adventurous uh, young people. Um, secondly, the arch spans were really quite small. This is a drawing on the right by Knight in, uh, in 1821, I think. Um, and there is, in fact, a, an arch was found in, under Adelaide House in 1921 when it was built. Um, but I haven't found a photograph. But it must, there must surely be one somewhere. Um, the third thing is the number of buildings on the bridges. So this is a wingard from a mid-16th century. You can still see the, uh, the old um, the chapel, the, uh, the old central gate, which was replaced by none such house. 
and the Stone Gate, which was, had been rebuilt in 1437. Um, the, um, the bridge fell, uh, fell twice, one in 1282 after Eleanor of Provence had been given the bridge estate funds and neglect, seems to have neglected the bridge, and the other in 1437 when the Stone Gate was rebuilt. Um, and finally, to go on to the, uh, the date of demolition, the buildings were removed in 1760 and the bridge finally demolished in 1831. Now, I wouldn't want it to be thought that uh, before the 12th century bridges, there were no bridges. In fact, there are a number of very substantial bridges in, uh, in Anglo-Saxon England, for example, Chester, Rochester, York, etc., all you'll know about. And a remarkable series of bridges were excavated at Hemington, which the first set had these caissons here, recreated in two possible ways here, which were pier, wooden pier bases with a lot of ballast inside. They were subsequently uh, strengthened after collapse by a tr wooden trellis bridge, and then a series of piles were put in place. So this was typical of the Anglo-Saxon bridges. We don't know exactly how many, but there were clearly a large, you know, fairly significant number of major bridges. And, oh gosh, I've done something wrong. Um, <coughs> That's it. So, just to give you an idea of, of what a timber bridge uh, looks like, um, rather unnecessarily, this is Ubain Bridge near Mandalay, built in 1849 to 51, but gives some rather nice sense of, a, of an old timber ridge. Um, surprisingly, to go to the English origins of stone bridges, we need to travel to that uh, centre of innovation, Oxford, um, where Robert Doyley, um, having been visited, according to the Abingdon Chronicle, by the, by the Virgin and asked to repent for his uh, land grabs and mistreatment of the monks, built the, built the bridge. The, um, the 16th century map of Brasenose, uh, showing the many arches which are now lie under, um, under the road to the south of the, south of the bridge. Um, and the, uh, the tower was built in the, in the 13th century. Um, and excavations by the uh, Oxford Archaeological Unit found what definitely thought to be some 13th century arches still existing. Um, and thought there was a structure of an 11th century bridge leading on for hundreds of metres uh, south of the river. Um, I should add here that, uh, that I was rather delighted to, uh, to read uh, about a decade ago that there was a fabulous, uh, there was a description of uh, this bridge as the finest surviving bridge, 11th century bridge north of the Alps. I thought, I wonder who said that, because the footnote just referred you to a series of articles. So I went uh, through article after article, each just repeating it, but not giving the original source. To my astonishment, when I got to the original source, it said, personal communication by David Harrison. <laughs> so I, I must, must have really been a rather drunken exchange. One needs to be very careful. Um, so on the left, you see part of the, uh, the river to the, immediately to the south of, uh, of the main channel. And it's said that there are some uh, medieval, probably 13th century arches deep, buried deep within there. And here is a recent excavation uh, for well, where recent work, public utility works done at, um, on, the, on the road south, on the Abingdon Road. And these are thought to be the, uh, this is thought to be the, the, the arches of the, uh, of the Long Causeway. Um, of an early 12th century bridge, we have Bow Bridge at Stratford. Um, we know quite a lot about it from early 14th century inquisitions, which, uh, which say that it was built by Queen Matilda, the wife of Henry I. Um, and there was a great deal of squabbling between the Abbey of Barking and Stratford about maintenance. Um, this was largely because in, in those, in, in, at, at this period, there was some thought about how do you endow and maintain uh, a bridge. Um, it is said that Matilda endowed Barking Abbey 
um, because you couldn't leave it to a layman because their heirs might fail, so they needed a perpetual institution to give the funds to. Um, sadly, this, this, this mechanism seems to have failed almost everywhere, and the monks of uh, the nuns of Barking passed it on to Stratford. There was then a large quarrel about who was responsible. And so we see, as the Middle Ages progresses, almost all major bridges have bridge estates run by people with a direct interest in the, in the subject. Um, there were probably more than, uh, than three arches in the bridge. Um, and it's like so many other bridges, been built up as the river's been canalised and only three of what were probably several arches remain. Um, it was a very major project. So here is Bow Bridge. Um, and then perhaps for this reason, perhaps because the channel was, the, the river was braided here, many small channels, lots of islands, a series of bridges were built right across here um, with uh, causeways in between. Um, the person who studied this uh, described it as possibly the major public works project in medieval England, or one of the major projects. I think everybody who studies any of these similar projects comes to the same decision. So it wasn't, you know, so, so many of them are major and imposing uh, public works. Um, next, we come to um, Framwell Gate Bridge. Um, on the left here, you see an arch that it is probably part of the bridge built by Ranulf Flambard, who was Bishop of Durham in the early 12th century. Um, it was described by Simeon of Durham as... that um, Flambard joined the two banks of the weir um, with a stone bridge, a major construction supported by arches, as if at this date an arch bridge is really quite a rarity. Um, Gloucester Bridge uh, is in fact a series of bridges again. So uh, there is Overbridge, um, that this channel was created at a much later date in the 15th century as the river was constantly shifting its main channel. Um, you see here Westgate Bridge, which is there, and beyond Westgate Bridge was, um, was Forum Bridge. So three bridges. Um, Forum started as the major bridge, then Westgate, and then subsequently Overbridge. Um, it's stated in the 14th century that it was built by Nicholas Waldred in the time of Henry II, and there's, there's no real reason to doubt that is the date of, of, of Westgate Bridge. Um, but it is, uh, I mean, if only Gloucester looked like that today. So, um, moving on, we come to what's the largest surviving causeway. I'm afraid this uh, distinguished-looking gentleman isn't me. Um, it's a mile in length. It's here that Bonnie Prince Charlie uh, ended his uh, incursion into, into England and, and turned back to Scotland and disaster. The original, um, the bridge over the river channels went in the 18th century, but a series of medieval arches of which one can identify one that may be late, thought perhaps to be late 13th or early 14th century um, survive. The first reference is 1204, but it may, uh, uh, but it's not quite clear when it was when it was first stone. And and dating is is a considerable problem for most of these for so many of these structures. Um, now the the longest arch bridge in England, this is at Burton on Trent, thirty six arches, a total length of almost a mile. Um, there's a bridge by the early twelfth century. It was stoned by 1322, though hard to say when, and uh, it survived long enough to be photographed, not a great photograph here, and there was a chapel and housing at the west end of the bridge here. Um, now, according to the um, 
historic uh, environment record for Staffordshire, there's arches surviving under a house at the south end of the bridge. And these are they, and I guess could be, well, you'll be in a much better place to say than me, could be 13th or 14th century. Um, and next I come to somewhere which is just a, a, a causeway, really, but uh, shows what very formidable bits of engineering were undertaken. Um, these were, Hull was, as you know, uh, refounded by Edward I, and in the late 13th century, a series of um, causeways were built across the floodplain of the River Hull to Beverley, Cottingham, and Hessel. Um, I've written reports saying that we shouldn't build on the, uh, the floodplain, um, but of course this goes back a long way and Hull is one of the very, I suppose, worst and first examples of floodplain construction. No environment agency to stop Edward in those days. The, um, he had permission, he granted permit, permission was granted to build three roads. Hull to Hessel was about five to six miles, Hull to Beverley 11 to 12 miles. Um, The initial roads were found to be, uh, initial causeways were found to be inadequate and were raised by six foot in the 14th century. Um, the cost of this, the cost of this was very considerable. Uh, in the mid 15th century, Robert Home left 46 pounds for the repair of these roads. And Leyland, uh, travelling from, uh, from Cottingham to, uh, to Hull, uh, Notice there were two miles of two miles of causeway diked uh, with ditches on all both sides. Um, by the uh, we have wonderful records for the fifteenth century for Abingdon Bridge here. Um, there's a magnificent poem survives. Um, it's in a tablet in the almshouse at uh, Christ's Hospital, uh, but alas is. Uh, is illegible, but fortunately was recorded by Thomas Hearn and put into his edition of Leyland. Um, the bridge itself, we know, uh, had 300 men working on it in the summer of 1416, and a thousand marks were spent in that year. Um, the poem records uh, the efforts of, uh, of one of the young men to, uh, to hold back the water, so we might assume that some sort of coffer dam was in use. The whole works went from the river at Abingdon here, a long causeway down here, uh, Cullen Bridge, which is, so this is the town bridge here, which is in two parts, this is part of it, Cullen Bridge, which was here over the swift ditch or backwater, uh, and across this was a uh, causeway of which you see some part here, and the road continued to Dorchester. I think it was all part of an attempt to provide land transport from Abingdon to Henley uh, because the river in the late Middle Ages had become unnavigable as far as Abingdon and Henley was largely used as the main port. Um, in uh, the 1427, Sir Gerard Braybrook left money for the completion of this fabulous bridge at uh, a Barford um, across the across the Great Ouse. There had not been a bridge there before. It's a new bridge of this period, as Abingdon was. Nearby is the uh, is the bridge of uh, of St Ives, um, with its chapel. Again, early fifteenth century. Um, but what I point out here is the uh, are the flood arches. These are these are a reconstruction, and to show the river in flood. So it shows how how medieval designers, as modern ones do, had to make allowance for the fact that, um, that they needed to cover the whole floodplain rather than just the river channels in some way or other. And we have a long series of accounts for work on the, uh, on the causeway, which records adding uh, sand and gravel on an annual, on an annual basis. Um, one of the joys of St Ives here is that it's... Uh, is it's closed to traffic, so you have to go quite, you know, have to go several, uh, several hundred yards or so 
um, upstream to, uh, to cross the, the Great Ouse. And it reminded me of just how wonderful the, uh, the continental bridges are. This is at Prague, where the International Bridges Group met in uh, several uh, merry days in, uh, in July this year. And just as a way of a digression, it shows really what could be done with, uh, with medieval bridges in England if we were to, uh, to follow the example of St Ives and, uh, and the continent. Um, by the, uh, the end of the Middle Ages, most bridges were, uh, were of stone, but there were a, f a number of timber bridges left, particularly on the Lower Thames between London and, and Reading. This is the one at, uh, at Staines, and again, to the, uh, to the right of the, of the sort of rather sad survival of a very important uh, causeway at Egham. Uh, Staines didn't seem to have a sufficient endowment to, be, uh, to maintain the bridge during the Middle Ages. There was a constant recipient of pontage grants, which very commonly refer to the causeway as well. So, um, having looked at really the date, something of the date of construction, uh, these causeways, great causeway bridges, I'd now like to turn to the estuarine bridges. Um, the top is a diagram of the bridge made, off, made after the fire of, of London Bridge, made after the fire of 1633. And underneath is a, um, a drawing of the bridge taken in 1821 by, by Knight. As so many people have said, huge problems caused by having these great starlings which required constant maintenance. Um, but the real problem was that there was no other way of building a bridge in tidal waters in deep tidal waters with leaky gravel until many centuries later. So what was done is, first of all, um, uh, some piles were put in here. Uh, water, they couldn't be watertight because of the changing, uh, the changing tide, the leaky gravel. Stones and rubble were put in, um, and then they were surrounded by these things called starlings with another ring of, uh, of piles into which more stones were put to try and make the bridge stable. It obviously far, was far from satisfactory, but given how rarely London Bridge fell and with huge maintenance, um, it worked. Other potential extra bridges built about the same time as, as London Bridge um, Walter Gervais was the, was the main uh, instigator. Hooker says in the late 16th century that he spent £10,000. I mean, I don't know what to make of that. The, uh, the bridge, uh, the main bridge, was, um, was demolished in 1771, but a series of arches survive, which have been studied by, uh, by Stuart Brown, and there should be a great monograph coming out uh, this year, I hope. Um, this strange map here is as it is now, uh, showing uh, it's upside down so I could get the bridge going in the, uh, in the right direction. Here is the old bridge, here is the 18th century bridge, and there is the extraordinary excrescence built in the, uh, in the late 60s and 70s to, uh, to allow far too much uh, traffic into the centre of Exeter. This is a drawing of 1662 by Schelling, and it shows how... Um, how much easier it was to, uh, in a way, to construct the, uh, the bridge at, at Exeter, which, when it was constructed, was at the sort of end of the, uh, of the tidal range at, uh, on the X. Subsequently, um, its conditions were made even better because Countess Weir was built in the late 13th century. And these things here, you see, are pack horses. I'm not sure they're just put in for effect, but they show the bridge is, is really shallower than it was at London. So it was possible to protect the, um, the bridge by putting in stakes, um, ballast round the stakes, and woven into the stakes um, were a sort of wattle effect. Um, so the wattle, in, wattle and stake enclosure into which cobbles were put. Obviously the bridge had its, its problems, um, and did collapse from time to time, but essentially it worked. Um, these are some marvellous drawings by uh, Stuart Brown. They show that the, the, and I went round with him this last summer, and I was quite convinced that the pointed arches and the 
semicircular or segmental arches were all part of the original build. Um, there's very little sign of, uh, of fundamental uh, reconstruction where the arches, where the piers might have fallen, which would have led to uh, reconstruction in, say, a pointed style, except for the eighth pier, which we can't see here, which is at the very end, um, where there was a lot of new work underneath on a, on a pier we knew fell. And here is the pointed arch and the semicircular arch, surprisingly, probably of the same date. Um, Nottingham, again, quite difficult to date. Uh, we have a reference to construction of a bridge there in 1250, but a further reference in, uh, in the early 14th century. Um, this is a nice mid-18th century drawing that both shows the, uh, the bridge there with its starlings you can just see here and then there was a long causeway to Nottingham which was at some distance so until the 19th century Trent Bridge was was in the open countryside um, two arches survive which at a cursory glance uh, Jenny uh, Alexander kindly looked at them for me and thought that probably of the 14th century um, a photograph survives before demolition and I think you can see here that even at this date, some medieval arches survive, but others had been rebuilt uh, in, in the 1680s and, uh, and earlier. Um, interesting here that, um, that Edward the Elder uh, built a bridge at Nottingham, um, which may have been on the site of this, though we can talk about it later if you want, I'm not sure. Um, but there was, uh, in Anglo-Saxon times, a sort of James Campbell-like powerful state taking the role in bridge building. By the early 14th century, the person building the bridge is Alice Palmer, the widow of a prominent um, Nottingham merchant. Uh, Rochester is, uh, like London, the bridge that created the most problems. You see some advances here on London Bridge where there are piled foundations under the piers and then starlings round it. But if anything, so you get, uh, when it was demolished, 10,000 piles were found. It was 560 foot long. Um, and the platforms themselves were 90 foot long and 40 foot wide. But Rochester Bridge did suffer more than London Bridge uh, in that there were constant collapses throughout the 14th century and very large sums of money had to be spent. I mean, 10 years, 10 to 20 years after it was built, two of the arches had started to crack. Um, in Devon, uh, we have two other very long bridges. Uh, Biddeford at the, uh, the top two uh, slides. Um, which was wooden until 1459 and rebuilt in stone sometime in the late 15th century. Um, Barnstable, however, uh, was built uh, in stone by the, uh, by the 14th century as it was repaired in stone in 1311. Um, here, the foundations were on sand, which made it much easier since uh, apparently um, waterlogged sand is a very good foundation. So what was needed here was the protection of the piers in the same way as they were protected Exeter with, um, with stakes interlaced with wood into which uh, the cobbles were dropped. Um, Cornwall similarly had its, uh, its two great bridges. Um, Wade Bridge on the right, this is a 18th century picture. This is a modern uh, picture after widening. And this is Lou Bridge, now lost. Um, Wade Bridge uh, is, again, late 15th century. And Lou Bridge um, was earlier a wooden bridge and rebuilt in stone in 14, after 1411. And it did have a nice little chapel on one of the piers. Um, and finally, the last and perhaps uh, greatest of the, uh, of the bridges founded on Starlings is, is Berwick. Um, built, uh, it's a, over a thousand feet long, um, cost £15,000, there are good accounts, built between 1610 and 24, built because of the union of the crowns and sponsored by James I. 
1611, there were 170 <coughs> men at work. And the largest arch was, uh, was 22 metres. So here you have really quite big arches. And now we turn to look at the way that, especially in the north of England, arch size increased over time. Um, possibly uh, the first uh, effort we can see at creating a larger opening is at Elbert Bridge, in, uh, probably built in the, in the 13th century. Um, the first bridge was built by Hugh de Puisse, but was then rebuilt, it would seem, about 1230, uh, though one of, um, one of Le Puisse's arches may be in this round arch here on the, uh, next to where the, uh, one of the bridge chapels, there were two chapels on the bridge. Um, Newcastle Bridge is the first, has the first strikingly large span, um, and it collapsed in 1771 in the Great Tyne Floods. But we know from a drawing made at the time that the central arch was uh, 55 foot and two arches on either side were 52. So we're getting really substantially bigger arches than we, than we had at London Bridge. Um, it still had these starlings and, and Hutton, who wrote the first sort of great work on, on English bridges, blamed the starlings for its collapse. But as more modern bridges collapse on the Tyne at the same time, I'm not really sure. It should perhaps be no surprise that, um, that by the mid-13th century, arches of considerable size could be built. Um, on the right is, is the uh, St. Thomas's Tower of the late, 12, uh, late 1270s. And on the left is an even, uh, even greater span in the Pont Saint-Esprit, 1265 to 1309. Um, with spans of 80 to 114 feet. Um, in, uh, in England, we get larger arches at Chester, well, similar to Newcastle, from the mid-14th century. There's good evidence for it being constructed in the, in the mid-14th century, but again, um, there's talk about it being broken in the 1380s. So clearly it was a long process of, uh, of construction. The largest arch is, uh, is of 60 foot, and it, it still stands. Um, this was a period when, in the, throughout Europe, very, very big arches were being constructed. The largest is this of the, uh, the Castle Vecchio Bridge in, um, in Verona, built by uh, Cangrande II, and has a span of the largest arch. It, it, it's so big, really, that you don't notice how big it is. The largest span of about 50 metres. Um, when I say it's a mid-14th century bridge, it's not quite true. It was demolished by the Germans in 1945, so it's a complete uh, reconstruction. Um, the similar structures were being, not quite so big, were being constructed throughout the north of England. So this is Framwell Gate, the older bridge of which one arch we saw of built by Ranulf Lambard was washed away in 1400 and under Bishop Langley from 1407 these, uh, this bridge of two great arches was, uh, was, finished in, um, was finished soon after the spans of 90 foot um, other places in the north are it is at Kirby Lonsdale um, there's no record actually of, of when it was constructed um, there was a Pontage Grant in 1365, there was also a Pontage Grant in the 13th century, but these could just be for repair. Um, the Royal Commission on Historic Monuments, writing in 1936, said the existing structure uh, couldn't be earlier than the late 15th century because it was a, a, because of the round form of the arch. I, I don't believe that myself, but you probably know better than me. Um, finally, of these great arches, we have the Great Ouse Bridge. Um, a couple of the arches fell in 1565, and in 1566, this vast um, span uh, of 80 foot was, was erected. And um, again, it was on Starlings, and this shows, I think this drawing by Varley, uh, nicely shows the, the Starlings in use. An interesting feature here is the, is the bridge chapel. Um, you see the Lancet windows in the 13th century. But this, if you can decipher, shows that there was also a 12th century chapel there. 
Um, when I first did my research, I counted about 100 bridges which had chapels. But subsequently, I've undertaken work with, uh, with Bruce Watson and Peter McKee, and now found there are probably as many as 150 and, and possibly a few more. Now, these were mostly on great and urban bridges. Um, McKeeb, who with, uh, with Simcoe, undertook one of the best studies of county bridges, that for Bed best and most comprehensive and most detailed, that for Bedfordshire, um, found only, uh, only four uh, chapels in the county, and one of them in the county town of Bedford. Um, although um, the chantries, the chapels were dissolved by Edward VI, a number found other uses and were not demolished till the 18th century. And indeed, a few have survived, as I'm sure you know. Um, at York, um, there was a really quite a significant establishment, four chantry priests in 1499. Um, um, and an inventory supply shows six surpluses for children of the choir. Um, they're obviously used for, for chantry masses, but also um, were used by people travelling uh, to and fro. Though the amount is, is disputed, in a great court case from the 1360s, um, various views, um, John de Cousy, a butcher of York, said bluntly, men who travel rarely hear, mess, hear, rarely hear mass, especially such, such as he saw doing these days' journeys. That is, common men, such as merchants. On the other hand, another person said that Coming from York, merchants heard mass on Ouse Bridge. The best known surviving bridge, uh, chapel bridge, is at, at Wakefield, um, dating from the mid 14th century, um, with a, a license for the chaplains from 1356. Um, here's another example of just how barbaric our highway engineers are, building this bypass bridge so close to the uh, to the old roadway that it really can't be enjoyed. You don't see any pedestrians walking on there at all. But I digress. Um, the, uh, this shows the bridge as it was uh, in the 18th century. In 1847, the West Front was completely rebuilt by Gilbert Scott. Um, and the old West Front was taken to, I think it's Kettlethorpe Hall, where it formed a very nice um, boathouse at the end of the lake. Alas, the hall fell into local authority control, was vandalised, and the, uh, the friends of Wakefield Chapel have tried to survive, uh, preserve what's left. And this is, alas, all that's left. Um, Wakefield was the first chapel to be, uh, to be reused for services, the first bridge chapel, and that happened as long ago as 1848. Um, other chapels were St Ives came back into use in 1930, Rochester in 1937, and a few other chapels uh, subsequently. Um, chapels could be in various places. This one at Catterick um, was by the end of the bridge. Um, and unfortunately, there were, bridge, there were bridge chapels at all the great um, West Country bridges. It was at these great bridges where the chapels were. The ordinary bridges tended not to have chapels. Um, at, uh, at Wade Bridge, the, uh, the Wade Bridge Institute was founded in 1838 on what seems to have been the site of the old chapel. Uh, Alas, it closed in 1912 and is now a bistro. Um, and at Barnstable, a plan of 1584 shows where the chapel was, which was, which was there. Um, at Bristol, the chapel was in a most unusual um, site. So here, it was built across the roadway, providing a very large interior underneath um, <coughs> Well, that is a, a 16th century map. This is a later reconstruction, which is maybe a little better. On either side of the opening were council chambers. Um, a series of houses were built across. This shows the, uh, the difficult mid-13th century bridge. has a, an unusual in having a fall like the bridge at London. Um, and these houses, sorry... So there were about 150 chapels, perhaps more, mostly on great bridges or urban bridges. Many fewer houses on bridges. Um, I guess it depended on whether it would be profitable to do so. 
and that required you to be in an urban environment um, where it made sense to to build houses to draw the to draw the rents um, and of course it, it needn't be on a great bridge uh, and this is Lincoln Bridge heavily restored but giving an impression of what it looked like um, there were shops and houses at Newcastle here, the chapel and a tower with a prison above and a series of, uh, of shops. This slide, in some respects, gives me the greatest delight. It's, it's Exbridge in 1777. It also shows uh, York Bridge with houses and booths here that were subsequently removed. Um, it shows the... Um, the old church at, um, at Exeter on the bridge and there was a chapel opposite which is, well I say barely discernible, it's not really discernible at all. Um, there's very little evidence of any burials in the chapels on the bridges. A skeleton I think was found here, though it probably wasn't Walter Gervais who it's thought was buried somewhere more prominently. But of course it was the parish churches that had the burial rites and, for example, Henry Yeavely, who, uh, who, from, who built, um, designed and paid for the chapel, St Thomas's, the Ch Thomas on London Bridge, was buried at St Magnus the Martyr. Um, St Edmund became a parish church, was turned from a chapel into a parish church. Um, but the real delight here is, uh, is this uh, opening here, which may be... Um, the latrine on Exeter Bridge. This was something we discussed in, 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 in at the conference in Paris, and I've looked out. Um, rivers were perfect places for latrines. Um, at London, Dick Whittington built a long house near Cannon Street on the banks of the Thames for 64 men and 64 women. At York, bridge wardens uh, built pissing holes. In 1544, there was a contract with a local widow to keep them clean just like the sort of situation you often find in many developing countries today. She was also um, asked to ensure there was no uh, fly tipping and people didn't cast any rubbish. In the 16th century, we're hearing Gl Gloucester of a common jacks. At London, the bridge wardens spent um, 11 pounds. At Exeter, um, a peck of lime for the latrine, Fortin's Hapney was spent in 1343. And possibly this long vaulted a, a vaulted chamber known as the Pixie or Fairy House, and possibly this is it, was the, uh, was the latrine on Exeter Bridge. As far as I know, it's the only illustration we have of a medieval latrine on a bridge. At, um, and there were similar evidence for latrines at both Salisbury, Bristol and Shrewsbury. Um, other public utilities included water towers, and here, in the early 17th century, next to the gate and entrance to Dee Bridge, Chester, uh, this water tower was built. I think it was somewhat oddly and probably wrongly uh, painted by Randall Holm um, in the 17th century. I'm not really sure it ever looked like this. And you see it again here um, in, a, in an 18th century uh, engraving. Um, similar waterworks at London Bridge, but there are also uh, towers on the bridge. And this is the one you just sort of see here. This is the defensive tower built at Chester Bridge in the early 15th century. And here we have a, a better view of it now as a sort of archway to, uh, to go through. There are probably about 30 to 40, depending on how you might define a bridge tower, in England in the, in the late Middle Ages. Um, they could be on small urban bridges. This is Bishop's Bridge in Norwich. Um, the tower was demolished in 1791, but you can still see that possibly this structure here reflects where it was. Um, it had its uses and played, an, played a role in, uh, in protecting the city from Kett's Rebellion in 1549. Two, there are two surviving uh, bridge towers. This is at Walkworth Bridge. Um, the bridge itself, probably uh, one of those no northern bridges with very large spans, probably about 1380. It'd be very nice to think it was built by John Lewin, 
who some people think might have been building the uh, the tower at uh, at Walkworth Castle at the same time, but it's just a, probably just a bit of wishful thinking. Um, at the moment, the tower is some distance, a few yards from the bridge, but originally, as you might see here, it was connected to the bridge, and I wonder if there was a drawbridge there. Um, the 1760s were a bit like the 1960s in, uh, in being a time of tremendous road improvement and modernisation. And this was the time when most of the bridge piers, much, most of the bridge towers were demolished. Um, Bedford Bridge, the old tower you see here, went in, uh, went in 1760. And subsequently, as, as a part of a scheme for widening the bridge, the, uh, the good citizens, the, uh, the ruling uh, citizens of, uh, of Bedford, realised because of the increase in traffic they needed to widen the bridge. Um, unfortunately, they brought in Robert Milne, who had recently been building Blackfriars Bridge, and he said, you don't need, uh, you don't need an old, that old bridge. It's obviously insecure. It's going to fall down. What you need is a brand new bridge. And so instead of being widened um, at much more expense than had ever been suggested, it was rebuilt uh, by Wing in 1810. Such was the difficulty in demolishing the bridge that there was an outcry, and it may be why so many of the other old bridges survive in the, in the area. Um, the bridges, of course, were used, I haven't, obviously haven't got time to go into it, much in, uh, in warfare. Um, Henry uh, Somerset gave me the reference. In 1265, Edward I ordered the bridges to be, over the seven, to be demolished except Gloucester. Um, there were also a lot of alterations. Often arches were removed in many bridges in the Civil War. Here we have a, a drawing of the uh, second half of the 18th century, showing that the, uh, the wooden... Uh, plank put in for the Civil War was still in place. Um, the tower and the bridge were demolished in the early 19th century um, and after 1770, between 1770, after 1770, almost all the bridges over the Severn uh, were demolished as part of the spirit of, of modernisation. Um, Worcester, um, which you can see a few remains of a tower there. Um, was pulled down in 1781, and it was found, the piers were found so strong as to be capable of bearing any weight, and were with the utmost difficulty demolished. Um, Shrewsbury had two bridges, this is upside down, so you've got, sorry, this is west and this is north. You have uh, Welsh Bridge here, English Bridge here, this is English Bridge. Um, the tower was rebuilt in 1545, demolished in, uh, in, 17, in the 1760s, when again the council planned to widen the bridge. But after they called in the engineer, he said it should be, uh, it should be entirely rebuilt and was rebuilt in 1771. Welsh Bridge had two towers, um, which you can see here and here. This is the Mardell Gate. The gate went in 1781. The bridge itself was demolished in 1795. Um, and all that survives then are some of these, uh, some of the piers that have been remodernised at Bridge North Bridge. There was a tower that, uh, that went in the early 19th century, and this uh, is a nicer view of it. But as I say, some of the, uh, some of the wider piers survived. Um, and lastly, York. Sorry, lastly on this on this bit of the talk, um, they decided to demolish again. They wanted it widened. Thomas Harrison suggested demolition. Demolition went ahead. And this is when uh, a man who must often have, uh, have been at the Antiquaries, at least, uh, John Carter stepped in and complained about the, uh, the planned destruction, um, arguing that there should be a bypass bridge. He urged... Um, 
He said that the reasons urged for the approaching him through the bridge is want of room for the rapid dash of equestrians and barouche drivers, improving the ready communication between the city and the race ground. Instead, there should be a bypass bridge. Alas, at that stage, Carter failed, um, but 20 years later, a bypass bridge was built. But the spirit of the times was changing, and after about 1820, very few bridges were demolished. Now, now just look at those which were. Um, sorry. At, uh, before I get on to those which were, um, new bridges were built in London, but in the Thames around London, it was impossible, really, at this period, to build a structure um, that was more sophisticated or much of an improvement on the starlings used for Old London Bridge. The first uh, bridge near London to be tried was 1729 at Fulham, which survived until 1885, and you can see the new bridge being built here. Here's actually an aqueduct of 1856. Similarly, at Westminster, um, a painting by Canaletto of 1746, in fact, the bridge wasn't finished till 1749, um, Labberley used, uh, used caissons, um, which were a sort of barge with stones, the stone pier in the, in the barge with an opening bottom. It was taken to the place it was to be laid and, and dropped. Um, and it was seen as an improvement, uh, but very rapidly the piers showed signs of settlement and the bridge was demolished in the mid-19th century. So it may have been a little better, and people in the 18th century thought it was an improvement, but it certainly wasn't an adequate solution to building in these areas. The, uh, the first bridge to use, to be able to use modern um, bridge techniques was at Waterloo in the early 19th century. Um, you can tell from the name when it was built. Um, it used cheap piles and was able to make use of water engines to, uh, to take the water out and could for the first time, you could use a coffer dam for a Thames, uh, for a Thames bridge near London. Um, after that, the old bridges started to be demolished. So London went in 1831 and Rochester in 1856. There's a wonderful photograph here of the process of demolition. And the Royal Engineers thought it'd be great fun to try dynamite, given the difficulty of demolishing the bridge. And here you see the, uh, the experiment. Um, the last few bridges to go went after 1850, and these were all the, uh, the last large bridges. Lou in 1853, um, Burton-on-Trent uh, in, uh, in 1864. There's the new bridge very straight, and you can just there see the older bridge bending round. Subsequently, people said, actually, well, maybe the, um, the old bridge wasn't so bad after all, because it was an angle to the river, whereas this went straight. So although the openings were larger, they actually um, perhaps provided less of a waterway, or so it was argued. And given the number of medieval arches that survived, the case was made that it could have uh, stood perfectly well. Um, and this is Nottingham here, which was the last to go in 1870. But despite this, um, some of the great estuarine bridges have survived, the Biddeford, Barnstable, and, um, and Wade Bridge in the West Country. Here, uh, Biddeford has had problems, um, possibly following the great winter of 1863 when there's snow and ice on the bridge. The piers were weakened and two of the arches collapsed. But it was perfectly possible to repair these by putting in um, iron rods and modern foundations, and the bridge survives well to this day. So, conclusions. How, uh, how, how like other bridges, the other great bridges, was um, London Bridge? Well, as for the date, as you can see, um, quite a lot of building had been done in the 12th century, but it, stone bridges continued to be constructed uh, throughout the medieval centuries and were still going on in the 15th century, though by then um, the network was in very, very large part stone. The starlings used at, uh, at London were not widespread. Um, they were used when it was necessary, but I'm pretty certain that elsewhere um, 
from a fairly early date, coffer dams could be used. And as we've seen, there was nothing better in some places than starlings um, until about 1800. The demolition, uh, London Bridge, uh, the houses, etc., were removed for road improvements in 1760, which was very typical. But the demolition in 1831 was really very late for the demolition of medieval bridges. The arch spans, as we can see, those at London were smaller. And over the span of the Middle Ages, if you excuse the, the, pat, the pun, um, much larger arches were built, uh, culminating in the 90-foot span of Framwell Gate, which wasn't significantly uh, exceeded until the 19th century. Um, as for buildings, chapels, there were 150. They tended to be an essential part of the great bridges, but were also in urban settings. They were rare outside either of those two locations. Towers, 30 to 40, and were a key part of defences, especially in areas where this was important, for example, along the Severn. Um, shops, they were fairly rare, um, and I think really more or less a handful, as far as I can see, only presumably where it was profitable. Um, public utilities, uh, an impressive number of latrines on medieval bridges, providing a great service to the public. And finally, governance. Um, by the end of the Middle Ages, this was done by bridge estates, because it really was the only adequate way of providing um, proper maintenance for the bridges. So thank you very much.